to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. Ellen, how are you? I'm pretty well. How are you? Good. Well, let's jump in. Uh, it's so good to talk to you, by the way, and thank you for doing this. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. So before we get into the community players information, why don't you give us all a little bit of background about yourself, your theater background, how you became your president, right, right now? I am theater? this year, yeah. Take it away and give us your whole bio. Sure. Uh, well, actually, I always dabbled in theater as a kid and you know, in school a little bit, but never did community theater um, until 2009. Um, what happened was I was, uh, I was having a, a health issue. I was home a lot and um, a friend of mine saw a flyer for Godspell that the players were doing and she brought it to me and she said, um, you, you have to try out for this. And I said, oh, Claudia, you know, I really can't. I'm just, I'm not feeling well. And you've got to do it. You've got to do it. Well, I'd always wanted to do Godspell. I mean, that was my era. Uh, so I tried out, I got a part, and that was in 2009. And of course, of course, the bug had bitten me back. Um, so um, I've been involved with the players since 2009. And since then have done, sh done a bunch of shows, including at least one with you, maybe at least, more than yes. one with you, actually. That's right. Um, so... Um, you know, in my prior life, I was a lawyer. I left that probably 20 years ago now on account of the health thing I mentioned. And I have had no urge to go back. And uh, I'm awfully, awfully busy dealing with things that aren't paid employment. Uh, I know but that the, well. over, over the years, the players sort of figured out that I, uh, I was available but hiding. And so... <laughs> <laughs> bit by bit, um, I, I took on more and more. So um, I, for the past four years before this, I was co-chair of publicity. So doing all the press releases and the social media and all of that. And uh, this year, I finally agreed to be president. It's an awful lot of work. I'll bet. But um, I didn't really think that my, that my year as president, my first year as president was going to be like this. <laughs> I thought we were going to be putting on shows and um, <clears throat> I was going to be going out of my mind with overlapping production schedules and, and the things that happen in our very busy players, uh, universe. Yeah. So, so most people would probably think that doing no shows would make your job very easy, but I'm guessing there's a lot of scrambling you had to do this year. Oh. What, what was different that you had to probably attack that no, would normally not happen in a regular season? Well, you know, right off the bat, it was a, almost exactly a year ago, right, when things yeah. shut down. We um, we had Barefoot in the Park uh, under construction. And in fact, that set, that beautiful set, is still sitting in our workshop because, of course, everything shut right down. But what became clear to us and to any theater company that has overhead costs like we do, we have a building, and that has um, maintenance costs. and. Right heating and snow plowing and, and everything. And now our main source of income was shut off for a period of time with, we didn't know. So immediately what we had to do was figure out um, how we were going to pay the bills if shows couldn't open for the rest of 2020. Um, we figured, oh, sure, by the end of 2020, things will get back and, you know, we'll be rolling again. Well, little did we know. You know, right. be overlapping into 2021. So what we had to do right off the bat is come up with an approach that would say, how do we cut our costs to the bone and then raise the money that we're not going to get in ticket sales to pay those bills? So we went into overdrive on fundraising. And, um, of course, we didn't know at the time. Nobody knew at the time. Are people going to give to charity? Right. You know, businesses were closing down. People were getting laid off. Um, there was a hesitancy at first, I think, across the board in the economy. Nonprofits didn't know if we're not feeding the homeless or 
you know, doing something frontline, are people going to give to us? Right. Um, and the answer was yes. It was a resounding yes. Yeah. And it was because what people did was they gave to those frontline service charities, but they also gave to charities that they feared would be hurt and maybe even disappear if they didn't step up. And, um, and that's what our supporters did. We did really well fundraising because we were telling the truth yeah. that if we didn't get that kind of support, we would be in danger just like a lot of other groups were. Um, yeah. You have an extensive network of people anyway, right? That um, on like a newsletter or I mean, people that are, you, you can contact that aren't just volunteers. That's correct. I mean, you know, the players have been around since 1927. So over those years, you know, we've got a regular, a regular following um, audience members in the community. We have some sponsors. So that was the place to start. But uh, we really needed to uh, reach out more broadly. So, for example, last year, for the first time, we participated in New Hampshire Gives, which is a statewide fundraising fundraising um, effort that's coordinated by the um, New Hampshire Association of Nonprofits. Well, we'd never done that before, um, but we did it. And so we got a lot of new donors uh, through that because that platform allowed us to reach out to people who um, maybe hadn't heard of us before. The other thing that we did differently was we expanded our fundraising from just postal mail to social media and email. So basically we're just like, however we can reach people. Yeah. Even if we're reaching people multiple times, um, we're going to do it. We have to do it. How about your and, corporate sponsors? Were they pretty, did you lose any? Did, did they come up the bat? They absolutely stuck right with us, which was really great. Because That's incredible. when you have a corporate sponsor, one thing that you're offering them, you hope, is exposure, you know, their names on the programs, their names on the ads, the posters. Well, if you're not doing shows, you know, you're not able to give them that same level of exposure in the community. Right. right. Because they do it as a marketing, as a marketing benefit, as well as to benefit the community from an altruistic standpoint. So, um, no, but they knew. Um, our, our two main sponsors, Merrimack County Savings Bank and um, Rotary Club of Concord, New Hampshire, um, they couldn't have been more supportive. And, uh, and we're really, really grateful for that. So we, we had our, 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 our foot to the gas really hard for most of 2020 to make sure that we could pay our bills. We, um, for the first time that anybody can remember, um, we applied for some grants and we got um, a three-year grant from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Nice. We also got a grant from the um, State Council on the Arts. And again, it was those, those grant-giving uh, institutions, of course, they wanted first to fund, you know, the front line, yeah. people out of work, people, you know, having trouble paying the rent. But then they knew that arts organizations like ours, if we didn't get help, um, many of us would not have survived. Yeah, well, and the community plays of Concord are an institution anyway. You, you lose them. That's a big hole to try to plug, right? I, I, I think so. I do. Yeah. Think so. Yeah. so so were you um, able to meet your obligations? Uh, have you been successful in coming up with everything you needed? Yes. Yes. Of course, we don't, we still don't know when we're going to really get back in the swing. Yeah. Right. So now here we are in March, 2021, and we really have to do the same thing. We have to fundraise hard. Um, Man. Yeah. So, but that was sort of the, um, you know, the unfortunate, un the fortunate, unfortunate thing that we had to do in 2020, but the fun thing that we were able to do in 2020 was because the studio was closed, we, we were able to take the time to basically rehab our studio. Yeah. Just like all of us, you know, last March, April, we were like cleaning out our closets and, you know, we were all full of energy. Well, that's what we said too, because our studio um, is 21 years old 
and it is heavily, heavily used. And 21 years or more, actually, more than 21 years of stuff had made its way into the building. Um, you know, everything getting kind of dog-eared and worn mm. and, you know, the floors worn. And um, so we have several, well, we have a good number, six, eight volunteers, uh, retired, newly retired, um, who've been at the studio probably three, four days a week throughout this entire year. And Ray, when you get back in there, you are not going to believe what you see. Well, I saw some photos of the, what do you call that room? The rehearsal room. Yeah. Yeah. I, remarkable. So before you go too deep for people who have no idea what, what your studio is, can you talk about, I mean, it's a remarkable, it, it's like the seventh wonder here in, in Concord. Yeah. I mean, it's huge. It's vast. Talk about a little bit about what's in there. Sure. Oh yeah. Um, I love bringing people there for the first time because they, they are blown away. Yeah. They don't, they don't know it's there. And if you're from another theater group, you come and you say, oh my God, look what you guys have. Right. Um, so uh, until 21 years ago, the players did not have a studio. Like a lot of other groups, they were using church basements and, you know, empty warehouses, often unheated. I mean, you know, and our belongings were in people's attics and, and basements. I mean, it, it was rough. It was rough. I mean, there was one studio, there was one rehearsal space they had, there was no plumbing, you know. Uh, but anyway, so, um, uh, probably about 30 years ago, uh, a, a couple here in Concord, Liz and Dennis Hager, who were real supporters, they donated a piece of land to the players out in East Concord. It's out in the woods. And, uh, then over a period of years, the players raised funds so that we could build this building. And, um, what we did was we designed a building specifically for our use. So it looks like a warehouse. Yeah. I think of it as like an airplane hangar. It's this <laughs> big building. Um, and inside the, the main part of the space is what we call the workshop. It's more than two stories tall. Um, and the reason for that is that we build our sets there. And sets that go into the Concord City Auditorium where we almost always perform, you know, some of the sets are two stories tall. Yeah. So, um, and it's, it's got plenty of room to mimic the dimensions of the auditorium stage. And uh, we've got shelves and, and platforms that go all the way, you know, up to the ceiling with doors and wood. And it's a remarkable uh, workshop area. It is. And then in one corner of that um, is our paint area. So it's got a sink and shelves and paint and paint supplies. Newly expanded, by the way. You'll see next time you're in there. Nice. So that's that. Then next to it is a, a what we call the rehearsal room. That's where we have our meetings. We also do singing rehearsals in there. Um, that room is not two stories tall, but the floor dimensions do mimic the city auditorium stage. So it is possible to rehearse a scene or a dance number in there. I um, didn't know it, the floor matched it. That's remarkable, too. Yeah. It was designed for us wow. and for that use. Because we have been performing at the auditorium since 1927. So we figured we're going to keep doing that. So um, then off of that, there's a kitchen, a couple of bathrooms. Yep. There's an office. There's a little library where we have a large collection of plays and musicals. We've got some storage rooms in the back for our makeup, our sound, sound equipment. Then downstairs, which is the basement, um, is props, shelves and shelves and shelves of props that go up to the ceiling and set pieces. Yeah. Large and small props. You can get lost in there real easy. Well, Ray, where do you see that? What? Totally reorganized. It is amazing. Yeah, it's great. I can't wait to show people. The big reveal is coming. Oh, so, good. And then on the, the top floor of the building, um, is our costume area. So that consists of a workroom where Betty Lent, who is our costume mistress, mm -hmm. um, she and Gay Bean and others work. And then there's a hallway that goes down and off of it are all these closets yeah. with stacks and st uh, 
rows and rows and rows and rows um, of costumes, um, and they have them organized by period. So it would be 30s, 40s women, you know, contemporary men's suits. It's crazy. And on it goes. Yeah. So um, so it's, it's, it's really quite a remarkable thing. But by this year, all of those spaces were just overflowing, overstuffed. So um, part of the project this year was to thin out these collections, get rid of things that were broken or were not getting used, clean everything. And then um, with some money that we had raised for capital um, expenditures a couple years ago, um, take a little bit of money, a lot of volunteer power, some donations, and now all of those spaces look fantastic. Wow, I can't wait to see it. Yeah. The people who have worked a lot in there, uh, including yourself, they're, they're going to know. <laughs> you're yeah. going to walk in and go, wow. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can, I can imagine. I mean, just looking at the uh, re the rehearsal room, it was stunning. I mean, stunning, just right. the before and after. It looked like a TV show had come in and done it, you know. Exactly. Well, I have to credit um, Wally Pino headed up the uh, committee that was working on this, and he and Stephen Meyer, Rick Silverberg, mm. uh, Betty Lent, uh, Mary Walker, there have been this crew of people that have been up there um, – particularly the guys, uh, Rick and Betty, Rick, Wally, Stephen, and Betty. Um, they've come up with such clever uh, things to reorganize things. So hopefully things won't get as messy and disorganized as they did. Yeah. Um, and Wally, who was, you know, he's quite an eye for aesthetics. He, he even did things like he put down like baseboard trim around the bottoms of the walls, which had never existed, you know, because yeah. when it was first built, it was built on a shoestring, and it was like, once it was functional, that was that was it. That was enough. Yeah. Now Wally has taken us the extra step with the help of these other folks to to really make it look prettier and homier, and less like a warehouse and more like a place that's that you might like to hang out in. Yeah, it's really a remarkable place. Um, and for people who don't act and don't understand that the um it's such a privilege and a benefit and a reward to have a place like that where the set can be built before you even uh, have a read through and to be able to rehearse on the very set that's going to be you're going to be performing on that's almost unheard of it's amazing to me that is as an actor that is such a benefit that uh, people have to see the place. They really do it. It's remarkable. Right. Well, uh, we've been talking for a couple of years about having some sort of open house up there or something, but you know, I was really hesitating Ray because it's like, I don't want to invite people to our messy house. <laughs> okay. I yeah. want to fix this up. <laughs> then invite them. You clean your house, you fix yeah. it up before people come. Yeah. Um, so um, our annual meeting this year, uh, it's always in June. And so the plan, the hope is it's going to be outdoors at our studio grounds. And this is when the membership comes together um, every June. We usually have a potluck supper and then we have our business meeting, just like any nonprofit does. And we have some silly awards and we have some serious awards. Um, this year, that meeting is going to take place outside in the afternoon, it's on Saturday, June 12th. Okay. And um, and we will conduct small group tours into the building. We're not nice. gonna you know, have dozens of people flooding in at once, but um, that'll be the perfect opportunity to let um, people really see it uh, up close. Because yeah. the people who have worked on it, all of us are really proud, really proud of what They should be, on. they should be. Ed. Yeah, and you're right about the, the business of the set, you know, I think, one thing that always amazes people, like some of the tradesmen that we had come in to do some work recently, they could come in and they're like, wow, what is this place? And of course, the Barefoot in the Park set is still sitting there. <laughs> uh, Nora McBurnett, who is a photographer, she's on our board. She was over there this week taking some pictures and she just got some beautiful pictures of that set, um, which you'll see soon because the NHTAs is having their award show virtual this year. Yeah doing an unawards thing. And um, some of Nora's pictures will be in there. 
But anyway, I think one thing that people are always surprised to hear is that you, you come in and you see this whole set and it's got the furniture and the curtains and it's like all set to go. But then when it's time to do the show, that thing has to be taken apart right. piece by piece by piece yeah. on a truck, trucked across town, put together. I mean, yeah. that's that's the other side of it, you know. I do. I do know. <laughs> yeah, I do. That's that's actually great. I, I'm glad you brought up the rehearsal space because I was going to get to it. Um, so that's that's excellent. And I do know that aren't you doing a collaborative event with uh, the Powerhouse Theater Collaborative in Laconia? Yes, actually more than one. Um, collaboration is the is the watchword for 2021. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it's it's hard for us all to get back into theater because of the costs and the uncertainties and spaces. And so there's been a lot of collaborating uh, going on behind the scenes. Yeah. But in front of the scenes um, with Powerhouse Theater Collective, um, which is Brian and Johanna Halpern, mm -hmm. who have been uh, artists in residence at the Belknap Mill, they have formed Powerhouse Theater Collaborative. And um, so what happened in the fall was they ran a uh, playwriting workshop on Zoom. And Brian approached us, you know, months prior saying, what I want to do is do this playwriting workshop from which will emerge a dozen, 16 short plays. Then I want to have a festival where we get directors and actors and we put on all 16 shows and he proposed at the time to partner with us um so that we could help you know find the playwrights find the directors find the actors provide the costumes provide the sets um help with the promotion and all that kind of thing so um you know then along came covid so um the way it's going is exactly as described, but um, the plays have been written. The um, directors and the actors are now rehearsing via Zoom. And then uh, a set of those plays, so I want to say eight of them, um, are going to be filmed. So those, the people involved with those decided that they didn't want to do a live performance. They would continue with the virtual format. So those plays will be filmed and then they will be aired for a period of two weeks at the end of April. And the details of this are on our website and I'm sure uh, on Powerhouse Theater Collective Collaborative's um, Facebook page too. So those, those will be at the end of April. But then the rest of the plays, I forgot if it's a dozen, uh, I forget how many, um, will be performed at Rotary Park in, Colonia, in, in Laconia live. Um, that park is sort of affiliated with the Belknap Mill. Mm -hmm. So that's how we sort of got an in there um, to do the plays. Hey, when is that June? Is that what you said? June? End of May. May. The, live, the live festival is at the end of May. Nice. Those dates, those dates are on our website. Um, under, actually, there's a link on our, on our homepage. So, um, and there are lots and lots of players, members involved, both having written plays, directing, acting. And what, what's really kind of cool for the players is that um, these directing opportunities are by design for people who want to get into directing. So it's sort of a low key, low pressure way to get some experience with Brian mentoring. Mm. Um, and the, the players um, have an interest in cultivating more directors. Yeah. Well, you've always had a, um, what do you call that? Uh, uh, where people come in and you give them, they can do like a, a one act and then they can do a small stage and then they can do a main stage, right? You've always had that. Right, right. It's just that that, that has not been as active in recent years as we would like. Um, and so we've been looking to get those activities started again. Um, our organization has gotten so busy putting on shows in recent years. We do four major shows a year, mm -hmm. three main stage plus the children's theater project does a full blown uh, a show in, in October. So I think what's happened is that we've, 
our shows have gotten, you know, very popular, very big. And uh, we're so busy running, you know, yeah. hamsters on a wheel almost. Yeah. Um, so actually, that's sort of another, to me, another um, silver lining of the pandemic for us as an organization is that it's given us some time to um, to look at the goals that are outside of or only affiliated with putting on shows. So fixing up our studio, um, but also focusing on developing directors. So another thing we're doing right now to develop directors is we have a director's workshop that's ongoing right now. We had our first uh, session this past Monday and it's on Zoom and it's headed up by Kevin Gardner. Yep. I don't know if you know, you know Kevin, but... Yep. Um, very experienced director, actor, theater educator. And then three of our directors, Betty Lent, Waylon Bunnell, and David McNeil are helping Kevin. And we have about a dozen or 14 students. I'm one. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's, it's sort of a mini course. It's four sessions, but it's designed to take novice directors or people who are thinking maybe they'd like to direct or even actors like me who probably don't want to direct, but would like to understand more about how directing works. Mm -hmm. Um, And we just figured that that was something that we could do virtually. Uh, Wouldn't cost us a lot of money. We could offer it for free, which we we have. Um, So the pandemic has given us the opportunity to sort of step back and say, okay, what can we do about this challenge we have of needing more main stage uh, directors in our stable, if yeah. you will. So, so anyway, so the uh, play festivals is the one collaboration with Powerhouse, but the other one is that this August um, we will be co-producing Neil Simon's The Dinner Party at the Colonial Theater uh, in Laconia. Nice. Hoping that yeah. the Colonial will be open, um, and. The, the origins of that are that the dinner party directed by Brian Helprin was supposed to be our show in summer 2020. Done at the Audi? Uh, it was going to be at Hatbox Theater. Oh, oh. And Brian had his cast and his crew and they had been working on designs. And, you know, that was the next show that was going to be um, presented. Boom, everything stopped. And so after a time... Uh, Brian uh, and Johanna had this opportunity to become affiliated with the Colonial, which for those folks who don't know about it, um, that's a historic theater that has just undergone a tremendous renovation and rehab with CDFA money and sponsors. And it's going to be gorgeous, Mm -hmm. going to be gorgeous. And it will be run kind of like the Capital Center for the Arts. You know, we'll be bringing in acts, yep. music. However, um, they, uh, the, the Colonial, um, uh, dedicated certain number of weeks every year to community productions. And so Brian and Johanna have been invited um, to bring those community productions to the Colonial. So they were given an August slot. To begin, mm-hmm. um, uh, it will be the weekend following the grand opening. And so Brian came to the players and said, what do you think about taking our dinner party show and putting it on at the Colonial? Be kind of cool. Brand new, beautiful theater, you know, week after opening. And we had a pretty good idea that the Concord City Auditorium was not going to be open. It's a big jump from 100 seat potential to seven something yeah yeah well the nice thing about the uh the dinner party as a show to come back to is that it's a small cast um it's it unlike a a big splashy musical you know the costs are contained Mm -hmm. royalties and so we don't have to sell 700 seats yeah to cover the cost of the production We'll have a sponsor or two. And so it'll be a nice way to just sort of ease back in, even if the Colonial has to operate with a certain amount of distancing or other protocols, um, we may be able to go ahead 
um, given the special arrangement that Powerhouse has with the Colonial. Yeah. Well, potentially, um, it could be a wonderful setup. I mean, if you can piggyback off that grand opening, uh, if enough people show up for that and then want to see the first show that could potentially go on there, that's a layup, right? That'd be great. Right. So that's certainly our hope. And if the Colonial can't open, um, or if, you know, for other reasons, the show can't be done there, then it will be rescheduled again. <laughs> so i mean that's kind of the way it works right that's what we're yeah. all doing yeah we Welcome to the show, theater. Hope. uh yeah we still don't have a date for barefoot in the park uh because oh we you don't, don't? Know, we don't know when the city auditorium will be opening and even they haven't given you any idea that, that nobody no, there is they don't know they don't know but the other thing is i mean they were opened for a time uh in 2020 but the costs of operating there were prohibitive for us because of enhanced uh, cleaning protocols, oh. extreme capacity limits. It was like the cost of the production would be, you know, four times what it normally is while we could only bring in a hundred people. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So um, we don't know when we'll be able to get back in there because we don't know when they'll be open without all of those uh, financial burdens. Yeah. Um, but we're just going to have to wait. And that's why we want to do things like the play festival, collaborating in Laconia. Um, in August, we have um, a children's theater camp that we're going to do outdoors at the Kimball Jenkins estate in Concord. Oh, nice. Nice. Um, which is filling up really fast. Um <laughs> It's almost full. We, we announced it about a week ago. Um, kids are ready. The kids are so ready to get I'll back bet. to live yeah. theater. Um, and then we have a show scheduled for Hatbox Theater in September. Oh, what's that? Called um, uh, White Rabbit, Red Rabbit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Waylon's directing that, right? Uh, well, you know, that is a very interesting show, Ray. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you've never seen anything like it. Have um, you seen it? I haven't seen it. No. It played over it in Portsmouth. And uh, I, I didn't go. I had a friend who was in it. And I, I meant to go see it. But yeah. audiences and everyone are sworn to secrecy. Because yeah. what it is, is it's a one actor show. And if you have nine performances, you need nine actors. And that's because... The way it works is the actor doesn't get the script till the night, till the, till the performance. It's like the actor a nightmare. steps on stage. An actor's nightmare. <laughs> and the audience doesn't know what's going to happen. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, there were no rehearsals. There's no director. But your friend probably told you it's a fabulous show. I didn't get to talk to my friend, um, but I saw the reviews for the show and I went online and looked at it and like, what is this thing? It's yeah. just a bizarre, uh, there are so many pitfalls that could happen here. I, yeah, it scares and, that the <laughs> Jesus out of me. And yet um, it played for, I don't know how many months off Broadway and it had like big names like Nathan Lane and really Goldberg. Yeah. 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 No, this is a real deal. And it's been translated into 20 languages. Wow. The author is an Iranian author, I believe. Yeah. The hat um, box is perfect for that setting. Perfect. Yeah. When we were supposed to do it long ago at hat box. Oh man. Um, but that's, that's really the perfect show to dip back into theater because no, no, no. As an actor, it is not. <laughs> well, from an organization standpoint, it is because we don't have to get people together for rehearsals. We, you know, there's no singing. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, Ray, I don't know. You can get on the waiting list. You know, I think there's like, we've got our nine actors, but you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad you have them already, too. <laughs> <laughs> I think it sounds cool. It would be such a challenge, such a challenge. Yeah, I mean, it really, it could be so much fun on so many levels. It, it you know, yeah, could be. 
Well, um, our plan is for nine performances in September of 2021. Exact dates and times being just ironed out now. Yeah, I'll bet. I bet. I talked to Andrew the other day, and you know they're trying to move towards uh, getting a board, going nonprofit, and working all that out on top of trying to open the thing and get enough shows in there right. and have pitch night. And that's right. So, yeah. Good luck with that. Yeah. Well, we certainly hope that it works, that it, that it works. Yeah. Cat Box has been a fantastic contribution to the scene. Yeah. I love the theater. I really do love the theater. It's, yeah. You've performed there. I have. times, right? Yeah. Many. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I just, I just love the intimacy of it. You know, yeah. as an actor, I love to, to almost hear the audience breathing right on you. It's, it's just yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I've performed there a couple times too, and it's different. It's yeah. different because yeah. you're you're practically stepping on the toes of the fr- front row. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been in a few shows where I've actually saw people sleeping. That's been interesting. <laughs> That's the other thing: <laughs> how how not to be looking at their faces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're right there. I mean, they're like five feet from you. It, it... There's my mother. She's right there. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. that gets us to august what's the do you have are you slated you guys have things that potentially carry you through to next year well the thing is um because that barefoot in the park set which is a two-story set mm. it's, not, it's the full big deal is sitting right in the middle of our workshop and hundreds of volunteer hours have gone into constructing that as well as we have the cast was like within a week of heading to tech. So that show, that needs to be our next show Mm -hmm. at the Concord City Auditorium. Um, And so until we get the idea of when that could be, we're we're in a real holding pattern. Um, Our thought is that when the Audi does open and we can schedule Barefoot in the Park, um, then we'll be able to decide what shows to do in addition. We're thinking of going back to the shows that we had to cancel Mm -hmm. for this year. So there was a last gas. Um, I think we were going to do murder on the Orient express. Um, but it's all uncertain because you've got to be flexible. Yeah. And the thing is normally we do a kid show in October, the children's theater project, but those shows like any, they usually audition in may you know they're cast in june yeah and then they do a little they do some rehearsing a little bit of rehearsing and set building possibly in the summer and then the kids come first week of school and they're right on it well we can't plan for that right now and the barefoot in the park set is right there in the Still, space yeah. where they work <laughs> so we've got to we're going to have to look for other venues, uh, other options to do shows that are not going to be two story sets and, you know, big cast. Um, we're going to have to look for the, for alternatives, frankly, because yeah. it's entirely possible that the Audi will not be open Man. till mid late fall with the kind of freedoms that we need to be able to afford yeah. to uh, operate there. I, I mean, if, if, if we were offered it rent free, you know, yeah. maybe we could make it work. But um, you know, it's very expensive to produce a show. People don't people don't really understand that. Is the city's not working with you on that? Well, they'd like to, but um, jeez, we haven't heard anything about price breaks. In fact, when they were open, as I said. There were these, you know, the cleaning costs and everything had to be absorbed by the who was ever renting it. Man. So that worked, for example, for like a dance company came in and did a one night thing. Mm -hmm. And the families were scattered all over the auditorium, way far apart from each other. Um, And it was one night. So they had one night of cleaning. But when a group like ours goes in, at a minimum, we're there. The show opens Friday. At a minimum, we're there by the. Uh, were there the previous Sunday. Right. And, you know, we were going to have to sanitize every night, not just when we move out. And it was going to have to be professionally done. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, 
you know, there's the artistic side of it too. You know, you have this big, let's say 650 seat auditorium. If you did distancing, people would have to be sitting on the far reaches of the balcony and the way sides of the house and yeah. seats that our patrons yeah. are not that fond of. Yeah. And sometimes get roped off for that reason, you know, that, right. Yeah. And so it's, we're, we're, we're not too eager to be standing on stage, looking out at what appears to be actors, to be an empty auditorium. Yeah. Yeah. Oh you know, man. Um, but even apart from our druthers, it's just, it's a, it's pure dollars and cents. We can't afford to do shows uh, with costs like that. Yeah. 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 That's a shame. It's so prohibitive. I mean, it's making no money right now. You would think, I mean, yeah. they can do what they want, but it seemed to me something would be better than nothing. Yeah. Well, I think because it is a, a city owned um, venue, I think they, you know, they have, it's a little more bureaucratic than if it were a privately huh. owned space. I'm shocked. <laughs> um, but also, you know, um, any, any theater, any venue right now, and for the past year, they're concerned about liability. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. You know, nobody wants to be the source of a super spreading event. Um, yeah. We don't. I know. I know. So, yeah. I know. I know. So what, um, before we go too far, assuming things do open up and people want to get involved who maybe have never been involved, how would they contact you? What, what route would they go through? Oh, absolutely. Um, so if they go to our website, which is communityplayersofconcord.org, uh, my email address is right at the top okay. as president, and I welcome inquiries. Um, and then there's a get involved tab where people can click and sort of get an idea of the different things that we do. And the thing, of, the thing about the players or any large theater organization is that there are so many jobs. Yeah. There are so many ways that people can help, whether they, you know, can you swing a hammer, you know, so, so a few things, right. um, paint, even paint like, uh, flats. That's my specialty. Just give me a roller. I'll paint stuff black. Yeah, it's pretty brainless. <laughs> <laughs> you just go do it. Yeah. <laughs> but even things that are more involved in the production, like props, mm -hmm. you know, someone can be taught, uh, the props job over the course of a show. And by the next show, they're probably ready to head up the props. Mm -hmm. um, there's lights, sound, uh, producers, which have to, you know, they have to do everything. And then yeah. there are jobs like uh, designing posters, designing ads. Just hanging a poster. Hanging mm -hmm. posters. I mean. Yeah. It's a tremendous amount of work that goes to putting on a show. And uh, right now, um, with what's been going on at the studio, you know, we've been welcoming people if they want to volunteer to come and join Betty with your mask on mm -hmm. up in the costume area, because they're still cleaning out and they're tagging all the costumes. We have a, an extensive lending program. We lend costumes and props, uh, to all kinds of groups and people. In fact, we nice. counted them up recently and we've we've lent to more than 155 groups, um, yeah. thousands and thousands of items um, that get lent and returned and lent and returned. And that's quite a process. Running that program is quite a mm -hmm. process. And also, you know, when things come back, putting them all away, making yeah. sure they're in good condition. Um, that requires a lot of volunteer hours. So there are really are easy ways for people to, come to get to know us. Yeah. Um, for example, an, another thing uh, we, we did this year um, is a virtual murder mystery night. Really? So it's a murder mystery game where you sign up in advance and then you're assigned a character and uh, you get this packet of information about your character. And then you come online via zoom and it's, it's a play and people are sort of, improvising and acting their parts. And um, this it's a Broadway themed murder mystery game that's put out by a company that is doing this. What? And we subscribed. And um, so we put it out there and recently we had one and we had a couple new people who we'd never met before. Wow. 
they, um, they were part of the they took on a role yeah jeez and did really really well man so was has that been well received that that's astounding yeah um well the first time the first time uh it got canceled because we had like a dozen people or 12 people a dozen 15 people um and then a few people had to cancel and oh. I forget what was going on that week, a snowstorm or something. But anyway, um, we we rebooked it and we had it like two weeks ago. And yeah, there was a good crowd of us. And it was a hoot. Yeah. It was a real hoot. And the idea there is just just to bring people together for something fun and something acting related. Look, you know, people wore costumes. Of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we we kind of got the hang of it as we went along and the the improvisations got a little crazier and oh my god <laughs> oh really my god again, i wish you had taped that recorded it and then put it out there maybe we did <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so yeah but reaching out to people and, and another way that we've been reaching out to people and this is a great way to stay in touch with us and figure out what's going on is once covid hit we decided we would do a monthly newsletter. I was just going to ask you if you had a newsletter. Yes. Nice. And it's, Good segue. it's, it's terrific. Um, Nora McBurnett, Doris Ballard, Doug Schwartz. We have, we formed a marketing team. We'd always had a publicity committee that like takes care of show publicity. Yep. But this is more, what we needed was um, an effort to let people know about the organization and especially about what we're doing since we're not on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and so it comes out once a month, about the third week or so. And if you go to our website, communityplayersofconcord.org, you can subscribe to it. And it comes out every month and it has six or eight things to keep you up to date. Things like the murder mystery you can sign up for, or you know, different things you can do, different things you can watch, uh, pictures of the studio renovations, does it come out by email or is it a hard copy? It's an email. It's an email. We call it e-news update. Nice. And uh, Nora is really good with the pictures and the layout. It's it's easy to read. It's nice looking. And and I'm always surprised when I read it like, oh, yeah, we're doing that. Oh, oh, yeah. Wow. Wow. We've got a lot going on. Um, yeah. And that's just a really good way that people can just stay in tune. It just pops into your email box once a month. Yeah, You should do a virtual tour. And link it to that email. Um, yeah, you're right. You know, just have somebody with a camera. Even Josh down at CTV down there, yeah. you know, could probably just, you. someone could usher him through, someone who knows what they're doing, what they're talking yeah. about, like yeah, yourself. you're right. That's what I do. Just sit here thinking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Say, go do that. Go do that, Ellen. <laughs> well, thanks for having me here to talk mm -hmm. about all this. I yeah, you're welcome. I can't believe I haven't had I can't believe I had the players on before. I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> they, they fall through the crackers. I don't get it. I, well, the other day I was thinking, I, how, how do I get in touch with the players? Well, how have I not had the players? How have I not talked to anybody? I know so many people there. How have I not talked yes, to somebody? You do. Now? Yes, you do. Well, hopefully when we get going again, you'll one day uh, come play with us again. It's wild to see 700, five, six, 700 people. Yeah, in that space. Yeah. I know. Yeah. It's hard to imagine though now, right? It's, I know. Mm -hmm. I know as we're hunkered down in our well, onesies. Well, and then, you know, everything you see is everybody's spaced apart and it's like, no, we want to get in there. We want to be know. shoulder to shoulder. I know. Going Coughing crazy. on each other, laughing, spitting. You laughing, know. spitting on everybody. We'll All right, Ellen, I know there. you got to get up to, to Lincoln. So yeah. thank you. Thank you for doing this. I really do appreciate it. My pleasure, Ray. Keep up a good job.